Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the IAB open meeting. I'm Dhruv Dhodi, who's the rotating IAB member that comes up and chairs this meeting. And we have the IAB chair, Maria here. And let's start the meeting. So, uh, note well applies. Please give uh, focus to all the BCPs and our policies under which this meeting is running. Special attention to the code of conduct. Please be kind to each other and uh, be respectful of each other and take care of other uh, ITF processes as well while you are contributing in this room. Uh, some tips that you should be well aware of now that we are on the second day now, uh, please join the Meet Echo tool. We have the QR code right there. We have a common queue between the remote participants and the people in this room. So we will be using uh, the Meet Echo tool to queue, queue up, please use that. And for remote participant, please join the queue and do not directly send video and audio until you are presenting. Thank you. So this is our agenda. We'll start with a welcome, which is happening, and a quick status update. We usually have a liaison update. So we have Peter presenting uh, ISO and PC46 updates. I will be talking a little bit about the IP outreach coordinator and the recent activities we have done. And then we have an invited talk, which we are looking forward to, which will be our final topic. And of course, finally, open mic. Uh, what is an IB open? Well, this is when IB comes and interacts with the rest of the community. We talk about the activities that we have done in the, uh, in the recent past, since the last meeting, the technical topics, as well as architectural topics, and basically liaisons and our relationship with other SDOs as well. We do this to make sure that we are being transparent and visible to the community, and also giving the community an opportunity to give us feedback on how we are doing things and what improvements can be done. Uh, to reach us, we have our mailing list, uh, and sorry, the email, which is iib at iib.org. You will find all the IB members plus the members which are listed on the list. Uh, for open discussion, we have architecture discuss list. So we have very interesting discussions there. Please continue to do that. For liaisons, we have liaison coordinator at ib.org. Please use that list for liaison related queries. And now I pass on to Maria. Okay, quick update on what we did since the last meeting. So we are about to uh, publish the workshop report for the M10 workshop that is uh, approved already and we're just waiting for the RFC editor to publish it, yes. Um, and then we have two documents in community review which might be even more interesting for you because you can, you can still give feedback. And one of them is the uh, uh, envir environmental impact workshop report. And the other one is privacy partitioning. So I don't you know if you remember the second document here that was presented like a couple of meetings back. And we are now thinking this is ready for publication. So last chance to give input to us. I knew I was driving. <laughs> okay, um, then let's go on, on for the programs. That's more exciting this time. So EDM is uh, the one standing program we had so far. EDM was a meeting on Monday in the lunch break, and they are working on a new document, which is about greasing. So if you're interested in greasing, um, please look at the document, please provide input, and you can subscribe to the mailing list if you missed the meeting. And then we have a new program, E-Impact, yay. So this is a venue for discussing environmental impact. It's a follow-up from the workshop we had last year. Or was it this year? No, it was last year. <laughs> um, and we had a first meeting uh, this lunch break. Um, there was a lot of interest, a lot of participants. Um, and there's a mailing list you can join. And I don't know if there's anything else to say. <laughs> Okay, next. And um, this might also be of interest for you. So at the last IB Open meeting, we were proposing uh, a new program on identity management that was called Houdis. Um, and we got a lot of input. Uh, we got also a lot of people who were interested in this topic. And it generated a lot of discussion. So what we did is we also created an open mailing list, which was called or is called Identity Discuss. Um, and we tried on this mailing list to figure out what should be the scope of the program. And there was a lot of interest, uh, but we didn't find a real scope in order to make sure the, the, the work we can do in the program moves forward. Um, but more importantly is actually that there is already work underway. 
we saw today, just earlier today, the WISMI, the WIMC, sorry, <laughs> um, BOF, and then yesterday there was, this, no, also this morning, the SPICE BOF. Um, so these are both related. I think these are efforts that really um, move the discussion in the right direction. And so we don't see necessarily a um, uh, place for the IAP to be driving that because we think it's driving already in the right direction. However, I want to say the IAB is still here to help. So if you think we should do something for you, please come back to us. Okay, so that's the part about programs. Um, a quick update about liaisons, um, just some numbers. Uh, also, we sent a liaison statement, the IAB sent a liaison statement um, in the last couple of months, and we just recently received one. You can look this up on your own. Um, the more interesting news is we have a new liaison manager for ITU SG15. Thank you, Deborah, for joining this position. Also, thank you, John, for serving previously in this position. And we have a new um, W3C coordination group. So this is following uh, the pattern that we also have for other liaison work, where both of the liaison managers from us to them, as well as a liaison manager from the other organization to us, together um, share this group in order to have a more frequent exchange about over topics of overlap. So that also is now um, in place for W3C. And then uh, last on this slide, we have the liaison coordination office hours in the lunch break on Thursday, if you have any further questions about liaison management. Workshop, one more exciting topic. We have uh, an upcoming workshop in January about barriers to internet access of services. The scope of this workshop is kind of answering the question, what does it actually mean for user to be connected to the internet? What are the barriers? What are the different barriers in terms of um, filtering and blocking, but maybe also device constraints? So we want to understand where we are. We want to have measurement results. We want to understand what are the requirements for that. Um, and therefore, in order to like start this work off, we try to collect input on these questions. Um, if you look at the, at the IAB webpage, it's actually a slightly more extended call for contributions there. If you want to participate in a workshop, it will be an online workshop in January. Please send us a position paper because we need your input in order to figure out who are the right people to involve and what is the scope of the workshop, where will the discussion go. And that was the update part. Any quick questions about those parts? which is great because then we can move on to Peter. Two hands. Okay, good afternoon folks. My name is Peter Koch and I happen to be your liaison manager for ISO TC46. Can I ask you for a quick show of hands, how many of you have been involved in ISO work, this or other committees? I only see a very few. That makes me more confident to stand here. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. So, and let's, let's try to find out whether the clicker works. It doesn't. Okay, okay. Cool. <clears throat> okay, since we just found out we need to learn a bit about um, ISO, um, this is just an introductory slide. So ISO is an international standards development organization. Um, it's the international organization for standardization. And just so you know, ISO is not an acronym. It is derived from the Greek syllable or word for equal. At least that's the story they have behind that. So it's ISO um, and the organization. And it standardizes almost everything. They have 25,000 standards around. Almost everything but electrics and electronics, which is covered by IEC. And you will find that other organization further down there. Um, it was founded in 1947, is headquartered in Geneva. It's an association under Swiss law. And its members are national standards bodies. Um, there are currently, I think, 167 countries represented in there. Um, and these, these uh, standards organizations send their experts to the various committees. The ISO is structured into technical committees, um, and then they are further substructured into subcommittees or, and or working groups. Technical committees might look like 
ITF areas, and at very abstract level, they might resemble those, but they have a completely different type of logistics and more boundaries between them. So it's an organizational unit. We'll get to that TC46 in a minute. The important part is about the liaisons. Um, ISO knows um, various types of liaisons. That's internal ones between the technical committees and working groups, um, a specially flavored one with that partner organization, the International Electronic Commission that does the electronic standardization, and to external bodies. And um, one such external bodies is indeed the IETF, or represented by ISOC in that particular case, but it's an implementation detail for the moment. And we have a so-called um, type A or class A liaison, which is kind of a platinum membership, because not only can we um, attend the meetings, get to the documents, we cannot vote because that's the uh, privilege of the national of the members of the national standards bodies, but we can or could comment on the work. And uh, this type of liaison is at the technical committee level, not just at the working group. So that's um, a broader range of, of accessibility. Um, and that is then also true for other liaisons into other TCs of ISO. Next, please. Thank you. So what, um, what does ISO TC46 do? Um, you see they have their own secretariat, which is run by the French National Standards Organization. Um, so that responsibility is usually distributed across the different contributing nations or contributing organizations. In this case, again, the French. They provide the secretariat support and logistics for that technical committee. Um, the scope is, and I need to read it from here, um, the scope is basically anything archiving. Um, there are lots of librarians and archivists in there, um, and we'll come to some of the subcommittees later. But we need to keep in mind that um, this, is, this is kind of an organizational umbrella only for the parts that do the real standardization work. Um, of these 167 standards bodies I mentioned, roughly a quarter, 42, are represented in TC46. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's mostly about identifiers and so on and so forth. And one important standard um, I will get to later. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of standards in there that um, people here might remember. The Dublin Core, for example, which was um, very much a topic in the ITF like 30 years ago when we had not only URIs, but also URAs and URCs and things like that. And I'm pretty sure that Sam will remember, um, which is in one subcommittee, subcommittee four, and there's a lot of under other standards that are uh, done there. The way ISO works is that they publish a standard and it gets the publication year attached to it. And then there are review cycles. Every three or five years, standards will be reviewed by taking surveys with the members um, and asking for desires to update or actually abandon the standards. So you will see that the uh, number of the standards will remain and then the year number will increase usually. Um, in contrast to what we do with the RFCs where we don't keep the number, but we just um, count them forward. Um, the other committee, uh, or one other committee is subcommittee nine that has a couple of um, interesting standards which um, is so much about uh, things that aren't really um, internet related, like the international standard book number, um, standard serial number, and so on and so forth. And you can see that these are standards that then obviously have something to register. You know that for the ISBN, for example, all the publication houses get their own number. So indeed, there is kind of an equivalent to IANA, to the IANA function within ISO, except that it is not centralized. Um, it is distributed and then excuse me, again, run by um, the appointed, the respective appointed um, national standards organization or other bodies. But other than that, um, those standards that require registration will, will need that function. Next, please. And here you will find a number of uh, technical standards. One back, sorry. Yeah, here. Um, those standards are dealt with in working groups. Um, they are under the responsibility of the secretariat and you find a number of standards that deal with transliteration um, of languages and scripts into Latin or vice versa. Um, and you find one very prominent standard, at least for internet people, which is ISO 3166, the standard that 
um, delivers the or that deals with the um, country codes, the list of countries and their respective two or three letter codes, out of which the country code top level domain names um, are, are um, uh, derived. Thank you. Um, Again, that's just the standard. There is a maintenance agency for, for that standards, for example, um, but that is not under the um, immediate control of what we do. Um, the work that can be followed here is in, in a particular working group to work on that standard. And the same is true for the others. Okay, next please. Um, now for the news, no, no news is uh, good news in this case, I believe. Um, for the previous year, there were no real comments to submit to any um, of the ballots that uh, were provided because it was not relevant for, um, for ITF work, not obviously relevant. Uh, there was no colliding or overlapping work, which is one task for the liaison manager to look at or look into. And all of this in TC46, and remember the ITF has um, liaisons to other ISO committees as well. Um, most of this work, would naturally be um, relevant for what earlier was the apps area, now the part of the art area, like identifiers, anything about naming, internationalization, and URN schemes um, and the likes. And that's basically it. Any questions? So we already have a question in the chat about document access, because that's always an interesting one. And let me start, and you correct me if when I'm wrong. Um, so when, when you talk about we have document access, it's basically, first of all, you have document access. Our liaison managers to all the TC groups um, have document access, but they have it in order to um, use it within the organization, but they cannot publish it. So that's a challenge for us because we are an open organization. Um, and we don't have membership. We don't know who, who is part of our, our organization and who's not. Um, however, the process we, we are usually using here is that when you need access to a document where we have a liaison manager, you go to the liaison manager and get the document from the liaison manager for your use without further distributing it. Everybody can go there and get their own copy, basically. But with that process, it gives us a chance to at least know how it was distributed in case questions come up. So please follow this process rather than redistributing it yourself because that's really important to keeping the, man the liaison management right. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> just, uh, just as a reminder, a significant part of the income comes from selling those standards, which, and, uh, which is why this and other SDOs maintain their copyright and, and control the distribution. And like Mirja said, if there is a documented need, then the liaison manager may distribute the document and we would always uh, consult with the IAB in that case. Um, so we don't violate the, contract, uh, the copyright and we don't um, yeah, get kicked out of the liaison um, relationship, which would be bad. But in any case, if there's um, serious uh, or uh, demand, useful demand, especially for documents in progress, which makes more sense more often, um, then contact me or the IAB liaison uh, for the management. Coordination. Um, or any, any of the other liaison managers. Thank you. So there's actually a follow-up question. Is it the same process for submitting comments? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, the <laughs> comments... Um, so, I mean, I guess my take is our liaison manager is kind of a proxy for the community. That, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, for that, uh, I think in the extreme we could actually, if, if there is some related work, say, which is what this liaison management is all about. If there's related work, we would likely be able, but I would have to confirm how that works on, on the formality side. We could uh, probably appoint uh, an explicit expert to one of the subcommittees or working groups. And then um, during the ballot, the comment would have to be submitted by the liaison manager. But of course, the liaison manager can consult with experts. Well, actually, and, maybe and, the would, question, and would always do so if, if the need arises. The question, maybe the question was, do you have, can you also redistribute the comments that were made by others? I don't think, well, the comments, well, that part of the, that part of the works in progress, like the so-called ballots and the responses to them, they are behind that, uh, behind the gated access. So again, the distribution, excuse me, the distribution can only be in a controlled manner that Mia just described. Yeah. Okay. Lots of this, all, all what I showed, you can see in the open, so you know uh, what it is. They also have business plans for that. They really call it that way. 
um, for the technical committees who can look into this. Um, there's also this so-called online browsing platform where you can see many information about this, but you usually cannot get um, freely to the work in progress and the final standards because money. Yeah. So and I guess if you are in doubt, just talk to Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Or talk to one of the other um, ISO liaison managers if this is a different group you're looking at. Yeah, yeah absolutely. perfect. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'll just quickly give an update on uh, recently IB created a new role, IB Outreach Coordinator. Our aim with this role was so that we can do better planning, coordination, and better tracking of the outreach activity, especially the one that is undertaken by the ITF leadership. Uh, the role also involves coordinating with the rest of the leadership, as in with ISG, as well as in the gen area, we have EO directorate. So tracking activities and coordinating with them. You can find the details on the IAB webpage, as well as the roles and responsibility on the wiki page linked here. Uh, also a quick update on the recent outreach activity that we did, which was at the IGF in Kyoto. Uh, IAB hosted a town hall. Well, the aim of this session was to highlight the importance of the work that we do in this community, which is about common interoperable infrastructure standards and that how important they are in the health of the internet and to avoid fragmentation as well. So several members of the ISG and IAB as well as the community members participated in this town hall. Uh, we had folks in the room as well as remote, pretty good participation. The report and the video is linked here, please have a look. And if you have any other feedback uh, on the outreach side, uh, outreach at iab.org uh, is the email. Please give us your feedback, suggestions on what we could do, especially from the ITF leadership point. So we are uh, hoping for getting more feedback from you. Thank you. Any questions? OK. With that, we have done the more formal parts here and we come to our invited talk. We have Leslie Kim Kipling sorry, um, from Microsoft and I, we invited her because Microsoft um, published a report on nation state threats. And when I um, looked at this, I found it really fascinating to see numbers and to learn more about this. And I hope you find it also interesting and I hope um, that also helps us all to understand a little bit more what's happening on the internet these days. So, Leslie. Hey, thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear myself. That's cool. Thank you. Look, participation is fantastic. Uh, right. Um, so, I'm going to hear, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we are seeing um, from a Microsoft perspective in terms of um, not just nation states, but organized crime. Uh, and the title of this talk really was to, to think about are they two sides of the same coin, right? Because what's the difference between one versus the other? Of course, there are differences, but actually, we see oftentimes. Uh, that there's a lot of overlap and, you know, nation states will maybe sell stuff to organize crime and, and uh, vice versa. So that's my talk. Thank you for listening. And um, I'll see you in a... <laughs> um, anyway, um, so I've been around Microsoft for a very long time. Um, uh, I'm an incident responder by trade. So that means I feel like I've been, uh, I don't know, combating the hackers ever since the most chatty protocol on the planet, NetBIOS, IPX, SPX, people remember that. Um, and of course, these days, what we see is that they don't necessarily go after the protocols. Of course, they do, especially when we're talking about OT environments, so operational technology environments. There's a lot of work that goes into actually thinking about how to compromise those. But as Microsoft, um, if you've ever heard of the Jericho Forum, you know that zero trust networking was something that was derived by them years ago. Uh, but essentially, it's a little bit polarized um, from the point of view of the... Um, the industry at the moment, Microsoft is really looking at it from an identity perspective. Identity first, by the way, not last, not only, I should say. Okay? Others are looking at it from the network protocols up. Right? And I think it's true to say that there is um, benefits from both views. But from ours, what we see is that the attackers really have um, moved over to thinking about what is the easiest way to do something. So we have the saying, which basically is attackers don't break in, they log on, right? Because if they can, can go after the identities, then that's what the attackers are going to do because it's low uh, total cost of ownership. So having put my pitch out there, um, essentially what I'm going to do really is give you a, a couple of what we've seen from the point of view of uh, the industry overall. Uh, anybody heard of the Microsoft Digital Defense Report? 
and everybody's read 180 pages of the thing. No, I'm sure not. Um, but essentially, it's, um, it's really a way for us to encapsulate what we're seeing with all of that huge amount of data and diversity of data that we have uh, and being able to replicate it out there for uh, other people to consume. But that's not the only way, because one of the things that we do at Microsoft is have cool team names, right? So uh, Mystic is our Microsoft 3 Intel team. Um, one of the teams I've worked with for years. Uh, my background really is also is working with the Cyber Defense Operations Center, so the CDOC. Um, thinking about how we protect ourselves, because it used to be a saying at Microsoft that we were the second most attacked entity on the planet, right? Right after um, the White House and any Gov address. And back in the day, you know, I did see the firewall logs that would have supported that, but I think that was a while ago, right? Uh, but essentially then give you some uh, case studies from the point of view of what we've seen in Mystic that help support this as an argument, because the other consideration is if you are a, an organization that's been compromised, why do you care whether it's nation states or not, right? There is a reason to attribute. We attribute very carefully as Microsoft. Um, from a, obviously from a political perspective, maybe a legal perspective, but in terms of uh, organizations who've been compromised, the who doesn't really matter so much as the what, okay? And one of the things I've, I've seen over the course of my tenure in this industry is the fact that, um, you know, organizations uh, potentially will say, oh, it was a nation states that attacked me. There was nothing I could do about that and so put their hands in their pockets. So, so really, the un, really that we didn't really expect to, to have happen. But also, um, I think that's turning on its head now a little bit from the cyber security, um, cyber insurance industry, right? Because uh, there's many reasons why, for example, if you've got a sanctioned entity that um, you think has compromised you, then potentially you wouldn't want to potentially talk about it, right? Anywho, um, so here we go. Here's some of the resources that are supporting the data for the MDDR. Um, I reckon uh, that it's really not 180 pages, I guess. Um, but there are some things and key facts and figures in there. Um, a lot of the teams that are based on, on this, one of them is a detection and response team now called Microsoft IR. So it's formerly known as DART. I was a lead, a lead investigator for DART. And as I said, been working at Microsoft um, in incident response for years now. Too many to remember, just as well with my memory. Um, but we're tracking over 300 um, uh, different uh, threat actor groups, and I'm going to have a quick conversation about how we do that. Uh, and then think about the 135 million devices we have, all of the domains that we do. So one of the other teams that we have uh, who work with us uh, closely is our digital crimes unit, who work very closely with law enforcement. Okay, and that matters again when you're talking about distributed denial of service attacks and the fact that um, we can sync all that traffic, work out where and what it is the bad, bad guys are doing, and then do something about that from a takedown legal perspective, all right? Um, 4,000 identity attacks blocked per second, okay? That's doubled since last year. So one of the things that you'll hear us talk about is really the unprecedented sophistication and speed that we see these attackers going after um, companies with. The sophistication... I don't know, I've seen some really sophisticated stuff in my time, but what we are seeing is that sophistication that's been democratized um, from the point of view of them selling their exploits or, you know, if you think about a zero day, for example, I've weaponized a piece of software, I now use that piece of software or that mechanism to compromise that organization. I then end up in a position where I've just exposed my hand, right? Not picture, for example. Um, so there's a lot of things that we uh, like to think about and how we track these attackers and try and block them from doing what they're doing. Um, that 23% annual rise in the cases that are processed by the Microsoft Security Response Center are essentially vulnerabilities in Microsoft software or potentially, um, guys, there's a problem here you need to look at, all right? Secure Futures Initiative. Does anybody remember the Secure Windows Initiative? Back in the trustworthy computing days? Okay, a few hands gone up. Um, well, we've just announced that we're going to do the Secure Futures Initiative that's really focused on three different things from a Microsoft perspective. Um, I'm so surprised you guys didn't ask me to talk about AI, right? Um, by the way, it's machine learning, not AI, but, you know, I'm losing that battle, so. <laughs> so I'm going to call it AI and just propagate the myth. Um, but essentially, the, the um, you know, thinking about how we can securely use these technologies, because like anything, um, with new technology, there comes societal impact one way or the other. So there's pros, there's cons, they get weaponized by the bad guys. 
uh, that's certainly something that we are expecting to see going forward. Um, the second thing, of course, is thinking about our people, process, and technology. So it's not just about technology. I know we're Microsoft, but thinking about how we get all of the people and process to work together. Uh, and then lastly, thinking about Rust um, as a development platform rather than using um, C Sharp and C++, which we've had for years, and maybe the end of buffer overflows, but don't hold your breath. Um, anyway, oh, nice color. That was to wake you up a little bit. Um, this is the threat actor taxonomy uh, that we've moved to. Back in the day, it was chemical symbols. I've been fighting strontium, um, plutonium, you know, all of these guys for many years, and then they changed the nomenclature on me, uh, obviously because we were going to run out of chemical symbols. All right? And I did mention this right in the beginning. They went, no, no, no. How can you have more than 180 mm, um, you know, threat actor groups? Well, now we have weather, okay? Um, so you'll see, for example, that North Korea, anything to do with sleet. I've picked on Onyx sleet as a um, quick case study. Uh, China, uh, which are the typhoons. Then we're going to talk about blizzards from Russia and Iran being sandstorms. And then uh, actually moving away from Lebanon, which has played rain or anything to do with rain. And then the storms, which essentially are our old dev groups. Um, but anything we were thinking about influence operations would be flood cyber mercenaries, which we're seeing a lot of uptake, which is maybe one of the reasons why this two sides of the same coin uh, conversation is um, supported. Right. Um, in uh, this is one of the, the type of ways that we can expose the information that we have. So bear in mind that if you are using the Microsoft technology platform, all right, uh, threat intelligence is built into that. That comes for you, all right? If, however, you want the curated, expert, analyst-driven information on the back end, then you have to do um, something called Microsoft Defender for Threat Intel, all right? And then you get curated reports, some of which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Um, but this is certainly um, what we saw back in January to March, and we're expecting the next one out um, in the beginning. You'll be able to see that we talk about most targeted sectors, um, this is one way of looking at this information. And this information, by the way, comes from what we call nation states notifications, right? These are the notifications that we will give to organizations who've been compromised by a nation state. So you can already see that in a way we make that little container around nation states versus organized crimes ourselves. Because if we're talking about organized crimes, the crime is then targeted um, attack notifications, so TANs. We also have DANs, right, which is our um, Defender for Experts um, alert notification. So we've got three different types of notifications that go out to customers, a nation states notification, for obvious reasons, nation states, um, and then anything to do with ta targeted attack notifications for organized crime. So already we're making the separation, which in fact I don't think we should be doing. Um, but one of the things we can see through some of the other um, views into this data is that education is one of the big, uh, most targeted sectors for obvious reasons, right? Especially if you're thinking about influence operations, if you're trying to get to um, personas of interest, then that's certainly something that you can um, attack because also in general, they don't have the same sort of controls that, you know, big organizations have. Um, you'll see on here, United Kingdom, um, normally the biggest set of that, of biggest targeted attack uh, sector for that. But in fact, there was a recent uh, attack on France and um, Italy from the influence operations perspective, and that's pushed them um, up a little bit as well. Uh, but really, you can look at this and, and look at around about 56% of this information is uh, focused on the Ukraine. All right? I don't want to spend too much information on that, and you have to give me a five minute warning. Um, so this, as I said, is kind of an overview of all of the, the sort of things that we do on a monthly basis. We will release this and say, um, you know, here's a list of things. As you drill down into those, you can get more information on them. Um, state of cybercrime, I'm sorry, these um, slides seem to have a mind of their own. Um, but essentially, what, two of the things to point out here, one is 50, uh, sorry, 70 percent of all organizations now from a ransomware attack perspective are small, medium business again, because they don't have the amount of money to be able to, to put into uh, potentially protecting themselves. Um, 80 to 90% of this from a ransomware perspective is through unmanaged devices, right? So we do want to be thinking about what we can do um, to increase that bar from a fundamental protection perspective. So thinking about minimum viable company as a term that I've heard come up recently. 
uh, which basically means, you know, how do you prioritize returning yourself to business if you've been whacked by something like not petrol or wanna cry or some of those bigger tags. Uh, but certainly we're expecting ransomware to continue its upward rise and, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, right? Nation states are using ransomware attacks too because they think about how we monetize um, the fact that we're in sanctions, okay? Um, these are, are, again, our targeted attack notifications. I'm a little bit of two minds about this um, from the point of view of numbers because successful identity attacks is a vector. A targeted phishing attempt is a vector. How do they get into the organization? And then successful um, ransomware encounters and business email compromise potentially are the outcome or the result of those. Uh, nation state threat, I'm not going to go into this too much to say, um, you know, fundamentally we look at each, each one of those different um, nation states and then see whether or not they are what they're doing and then report that as part of this um, information as well. So this again is the MDDR report and the next couple of slides I'm basically going to be walking through some of the mystic stuff. Um, but we can tell you of course that there's a huge amount of uh, focus on critical national infrastructure uh, for obvious reasons and again this is where we see the really technical uh, protocol-driven attacks and, um, you know, basically going out after proprietary software and, and stuff happening. Right. Um, as I mentioned, uh, cyber mercenaries, if you can't uh, build it yourself, then hire somebody to do that. So we saw a massive upsurge in, in public, uh, sorry, private offensive um, capabilities, organizations who, who sell that sort of information. So you can expect to see this um, happening. And as I say, that basically makes it a little bit difficult for us to tell whether or not, um, you know, these guys have a, a motive of purely um, nation states attacks, um, whether they're specifically going after nation states assets or have that sort of motivation, as opposed to uh, some of the guys who go after things like gambling and nation states assets, okay? So again, I think it makes it a little bit difficult for us to be able to pinpoint them. This is how we do it, by the way. Um, this is called the diamond model. Has anybody heard of this? Diamond model of intrusion analysis. Essentially, it's the way that we pinpoint and pull together all of the different attack, uh, I don't wanna say just indicators of a compromise because they change very quickly, but indicators of attack, the sort of things that we see them use over and over again. So if they're using a weaponized uh, oh, I don't know, PowerShell, for example, then it's likely they're going to keep on doing that. So those tools and tactics make up what we know about the threat actors, okay? Uh, from our perspective, um, infrastructure is something that, from a DCU perspective, again, we can very quickly focus in and drill down on. So we like to think of where we can pull any of these, um, this information. And of course, as I mentioned, doing the sinkhole for that information and being able to pull um, uh, the data out and basically take the infrastructure away from the attackers. So if we can do this quickly and make it something that the attackers have to keep on spinning up new infrastructure, which I know they can, um, but as uh, quickly as we can do this um, makes it much more hard, much harder for them to be able to uh, continue doing what they're doing. So these similarities we can pinpoint, um, we see that overlap. So not just the fact that we look at focus on staff and mission objective, but basically a profit objective and focus on effectiveness. Oftentimes we see what looks like two different actors inside a network, but in fact uh, are normally the A team and then hand it over to the B team. Or I've now managed to take away everybody's um, intellectual property that I was after. I've managed to um, achieve my action on, on objective then let's think about the ransomware. Because in many times the ransomware is the first time that the organization understands that they've been attacked. But if you think about it, jolly difficult when you've just had everything encrypted or deleted because it's a pretend ransomware attack to be able to go back and look at the timeline and do that investigation, right? So oftentimes that information has left the organization before they even know about it. So this is Storm 0978, um, has both. Uh, from the point of view, they are um, very opportunistic ransomware. So again, that kind of um, leads to the thing of, I'm now doing something else for, for a nation state who potentially has hired me to do this. Um, opportunistically, then I can release the ransomware at the end of that for that reason. Um, but they did a, a phishing campaign. Um, they also, the aliases are industrial spy to, sorry, easy for me to say, industrial spy to underground. Um, but again, really um, looking at uh, ransomware from that perspective, okay? 
And then, um, oh, uh, so I stick that, stuck this in there just to say that whenever we talk about doom and gloom, we also want to think about how we're going to fix that. So we come up with a set of recommendations for thinking about um, how we, we raise that total cost of ownership for these attackers because we really want them to sweat for their money, okay? Not just log on and, and run wild. Uh, so that's there for you to, to have a look at a little bit later. Um, Onyx Sleet, which was formerly uh, plutonium, um, again, has financial and espionage motives. So if you think about the fact that they looked at the online gambling um, websites, we're really doing a lot of targeted attacks around that perspective, but then also thinking about um, some of the Log4J vulnerability that they used. And if I said Log4J, who in this room knows what I'm talking about? Excellent. Great. I'll ask you later. So again, um, if you think about that, uh, our capability in terms of um, thinking about the minimum viable company, what are Microsoft recommendations? You can't read this, right? it's a little bit too busy, just saying. Um, but we want people to walk away with the fact that if you think about and put um, controls where your um, business critical assets are, so thinking about your crown jewels, don't try to boil the ocean because somebody said to me, you know, if I'm gonna be targeted by nation states, how much money should I be using or putting into my business to try and protect it? Is that all of my profit that I make? Do I just pack up my bags now and go home? Um, and that's a really good question, right? So one of the things that we did um, release as part of this MDDR was something called Return on Mitigation Framework, right? So what do you get? What bang do you, of, for your buck do you get by using some, doing some of these things? Right. And that makes it a little bit clearer in terms of this makes sense to do this because it's um, fairly easy to do and doesn't cost me a huge amount of money, but I get a huge return on, on um, or risk reduction from that perspective. Uh, but these are the things that we think about, obviously, from the point of view of multi-factor authentication. And I know they're going after multi-factor authentication, okay? It's a war. It's what we do. Just keep fighting this war. But essentially thinking about, um, again, uh, it doesn't make it the wrong thing to do. All right, there's some work that we have to do from an identity perspective. So for one of the streams that we have from the Secure Futures Initiative is really thinking about how we protect identities going forward. So we're gonna put a lot of engineering time into that as well. Apply zero trust principles, as I said, thinking about where those um, controls are and uh, not boiling the ocean. Then also thinking about using extended XDR uh, these days, extended detection and response, that's the new uh, phrase everybody loves, loves to talk about, right? But essentially getting this platform of signals and putting it together into an observability platform so that if you get indicators of attack, then you can apply them to a graph because once upon a time people, I think it was John Lambert who said anybody who, you know, as, as defenders, we, we think in lists. Attackers think in graphs, right? So we really want to be thinking about how we change that from a methodology perspective. But also um, data is becoming key to this. So thinking about the security controls, one of the things about artificial intelligence is the fact that it's going to expose the lack of security controls around our data in a big way, the same way that SBOM um, did for uh, development. Okay, so um, software bill of materials, thinking about how that um, highlighted some of the, the dev practices that were there. Uh, that's the um, return on mitigation framework. I'll leave that. Do you guys get the slides anyway, right? Okay. And as I said, there's some other mechanisms that you can look at this. If you don't want to pay for um, our experts from a threat, to uh, um, threat intel perspective, then you can use things like the intelligence blog and um, what we refer to as WDSI, which is the Windows Defender Secure Initiative uh, capability, which again, you can show, you know, what, what's the most attacked um, industry, you know, what are the top threats that we're seeing out there, things like that. And that is me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Any let's, questions? Yeah, let's see if we have questions. I, I do have one question. So there was like uh, at least one comment in the chat that the main difference uh, between nation state actors and criminals is, of course, they have different goals. Criminals usually go for money. Nation state actors have different incentives. Um, but I guess there's also different in like resources or scale or whatever. Can you com comment on that? Can. Um, I, you know, that, that in the past would have been absolutely correct. And that's still um, something that we're seeing today um, happening from the point of view of 
you know, if I can, I, I can get money and make it quickly, then, you know, personally, from my perspective, I think I'm on, I'm on the wrong side of that ethics equation. Um, I'm never going to make any money. But um, these guys, of course, do want to, to make money. They want to make money quickly. So that's not going to go away. But what I am seeing is that merging between the nation states and the, um, and the cyber criminals. Because, again, if you've got a sanctioned entity, um, you know, what, one of the ways that you can make money for your, your government is to basically weaponize that and then use that from a monetary perspective as well. So um, those cyber mercenaries, so those um, private offensive um, security uh, organizations, which we, you know, really want to focus on trying to stop them from abusing, for example, Microsoft technology. So it's not just Microsoft, but the big tech firms are behind this 100%. Because again, as we see the ability to um, overlap from each other, I think we're going to see more and more of the nation state's capability flowing down to organized crime. And to be fair, organized crime are doing a pretty good job of being able to um, bring themselves up to date in terms of their capability, and that flowing the other way as they're being pulled into cyber mercenary. Okay, now we have a queue. Um, you can see the first speaker name up here, and that's Wes. Do you want to come to the mic? Wes, by the way, had to fetch me from the uh, foyer because I was in the wrong Marriott. Uh, sorry, wrong Hilton. <laughs> where, where am I? There are two here. Um, welcome to Deception. Um, so thank you for the, for the presentation. I've, I've done 20 years of, of similar work trying to track uh, TTPs and, and trends in those and uh, detecting virgin things. And, and you should know you are speaking to a room full of people that is in trying to encrypt everything under the sun, of, of which you know I'm one of them, right? Um, so I'm curious at what you see as your own difficulties. You had a good source of list of, of types of things that you know you try and get addresses from and uh, domains from and and all these types of things. That must be an increasingly in difficult challenge. I know you know there's agencies within the United States that have a program called Going Dark. You know trying to deal with how do how do you doing that? And actually the document that Maria mentioned earlier, uh, we had a workshop on managing encrypted networks. On, on how do you how do you how do we balance this tussle between the need for privacy versus the need for defensive related technologies? Um, good question. Uh, I'll think about that one. Thank you. I'll phone a friend, and we can come. I mean, you know, from my perspective, I think there's um, there's a lot to say uh, to say about encryption. Um, and certainly, in one of the talks that I went to just recently, they were saying, "Oh, you need to use encryption to combat ransomware." And it just doesn't, does it? It's, you know, you encrypt it as much as you like. They come along with their key and encrypt it as well. Um, and I know this isn't answering the question. I'm giving my brain some time to work, actually. Um, I might waste a long time. Um, I can offer you a data point that will help your thinking, oh, please, if you like, please. which is one of the studies I did was looking at what malicious actors are using in terms of protocols. And what I found was, though the rest of the world is going to HTTPS, it's too much of a pain to set up you know, uh, malware repositories over HTTPS because you have to create the certificate and then actually get it. It's actually much, so 90% of the traffic I was studying actually went over HTTP. Right. Um, so isn't that, again, bypassing the controls because people find it really difficult to go for it? I mean, you know, to your point, we, we spent a lot of time and effort trying to convince people that HTTPS was the right thing to do, you know, with a little lock in one corner and, um, you know, don't, don't go to this. And in fact, plenty of times we, we block people from going to those because we, we believe them to be malicious um, domains. Uh, and that's still, you know, I think we've done a good job of treating um, training people to say yes, right? So even though you get these prompts that say, don't do this, or are you sure you really want to do this? They go, yes, I really want to do that. Um, but I think the, the encryption, of course, you know, from the point of view back to ransomware again, is um, what it does do is stop you having to notify the ICO because now you've got a data breach. Because if that information is encrypted already, that's a good thing. Um, to your point, it then gets to the point where we're starting to think about quantum and what that's going to do from an encryption perspective. Um, but also the ability to... Um, offload those cycles in many ways, because one of the things that we didn't, we don't talk about that much is um, thinking about the sustainability of AI, for example. So if you've got these massive um, GPU disks that you require to be able to run this stuff, back to encryption again, is how much time and effort do you want to put into the encryption? Um, I've had people ask me, you know, can you, can you confirm or guarantee that this encryption um, key is going to be safe for, for what, 10 years? I can't even guarantee it's going to be safe for two, right, or two months, because what's the best way to, um, you know, steal or undo the encryption is basically steal the key, right? So all of those 
uh, digi notars and, and um, the fact that they went after the certificates themselves to be able to create their own key. That was one of the ways that they bypassed it. So I think there's many ways for them to be able to wiggle around um, as opposed to going directly after the hard part of that equation. Um, yeah, somewhere in there, I'm sure we'll get to an answer. Thank you, Wes. So Flo, yep. So short. Hi, um, Flo Driscoll, UK NTSC. Um, thanks very much for a really interesting presentation. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what the ITF could be doing or what the ITF maybe should know about to sort of support you in, you know, improving the cybersecurity of the internet. Uh, that is a great question. Um, so again, I'm, I'm here at short notice because uh, my colleague was sick, um, so I got dragged on. Um, but I think uh, that we probably do have representation from a Microsoft perspective. If we don't, I'm surprised yeah. uh, there are, right? Um, but I do think that it's worthwhile maybe thinking about, um, you know, taking the information really from the other side of that equation and basically building in what we see from the... Um, so maybe briefings like this is a good idea, right? To say, this is what we're seeing the attackers doing. Uh, you know, is that something that you guys can come up with a technical... Um, solution to the problem. But the interesting thing that Wes mentioned as well was that privacy um, rings, you know, isolation for networks and things like that. I think that's certainly something we want to see uh, organizations doing more of is thinking about how they use control zones inside the networks, um, a bit like the Purdue model. Um, but Flo, that's a grand question and I'm absolutely to happy to have that conversation with you. Um, if we aren't, we are good. Thank you. Thanks Flo. We just received a comment in the chat that we need more people from Microsoft, <laughs> but we have some. Apparently, I'm here now. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hi, Nicola Rustignoli, Cyan Association. Um, thank you for the talk. So um, as some of the mitigation techniques, um, you hear mentioned, for example, securing identity, securing endpoints, do not trust the network, zero trust, and so on. And I think what many people here do is networks. So in, in line with the previous question, then I think what can be done on uh, network protocols uh, to, to help fighting this? Um, and, and again, I wanna reiterate that we don't think that the network isn't a problem. We just, you know, most security people come from a networking background. I mean, didn't we all, right? Um, yeah. So I think that there is a lot of focus on, on the network, um, but the problem that we have, of course, as I said, if, if the identity or anything, so, you know, people going after Microsoft Word, for example, or um, living off the LAN techniques, there's plenty of ways for them to be able to do that that don't require them to do the deep level um, sort of uh, attack at, at that sort of network. Because again, you know, people say to me, um, teach me how to hack. Right, so how many books would you like to go and read and, you know, understanding the network protocols? Uh, I personally remember back in the day when I was being taught IP, they had this little um, video where they, they put these, um, they made it out like it was a bit like a postal system, right? So you've got these little packets that were being shipped around to here, there and everywhere. I'm sure everybody in the room's seen that, right? Um, but again, there's, you know, it's how you start um, to learn how to do this stuff. So if you're a pen tester, you have to know how the network um, works completely, right? Uh, but I think from our viewpoint, these guys are very much going after the weaker targets, which is that softer um, layer eight stuff, um, and then obviously delve in there from a, from a SaaS app application perspective, which doesn't mean to say that the network isn't a problem. Um, so again, what I'd like to see is more people thinking about, um, well, you know, we're talking about micro segmentation these days, right? Which I think maybe with the power of the cloud, we've got that capability. But again, it was one of the things I've seen talked about in the industry for many years, and nobody could ever do it because it was just too hard to do. Um, but, you know, maybe micro segmentation is the way forward now. How about that? Hmm. Yeah, well, not so not knowledgeable convinced. about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's Thank your you. solution? Uh, well, uh, my, my work is focusing on routing security, so that's, okay. that's a bit of a different uh, area, you know, securing um, data in transit uh, in terms of where it goes. And I think there's, there's quite some uh, debate about trust-enhanced networking, mm. so whether you should have a part of the network that is a bit more trusted than others, but, well, maybe we can take this. Uh, well, and I think that's half the problem is, you know, back in the day, we very much came from the point of view of if it was internal, we had all the firewalls, you know, we knew we, there was a perception of control. Right, that that's gone a long time ago with the you know the ability now to have all of these communications through the um, uh, through extranet, shall we say? Um, we don't even like VPNs particularly because attackers go after those as well. So, 
But yeah, thank you, Nicola. Right. I'll um, thank you. have a chat to you yeah, afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew? Hi, Phil Hambaker. Andrew Baker. is first, Andrew. behind you. Oh. Hi, uh, Andrew Camping for One on Consulting. Thanks for the presentation, for, uh, really interesting. I was going to ask to, something along the similar line as to Wes in terms of are we s screwing up cybersecurity by removing all the indicators of compromise, but he asked that. So I'll ask it in a slightly different way, which is uh -huh. are people confusing privacy and s cybersecurity, um, which you sort of hinted at when you mentioned about you know, people think by encrypting stuff, they become proof from ransomware. So is, is that sort of confusing your area um, and confusing the people you're trying to help, um, do you think? Um, I think as often as I possibly can, but it doesn't work out very well sometimes. Um, so yes, and thank you for the translation. Um, you know, there was always that encryption, data, data and transit should be encrypted and at rest. And, and, and then, you know, sometimes you had to pass gateways that you'd have to decrypt it and then pass it on and then re-encrypt it and that sort of thing. Um, indicators um so from a privacy perspective we like to say that you can have um security without privacy but you can't have privacy without security right so you've got to have that foundational capability there before you start thinking about privacy um of course one of the things that i wish that we did i mean gdpr did a great job from a security from a privacy perspective right really set some very high boundaries in terms of what um the requirements were and very explicit by the way about what those requirements were for um for privacy we don't have that in cybersecurity. I think we've got something like 140 different regulations coming down the, the line over the next year or so. So, you know, in a way, it would be really good, or, albeit as tough as it was for us to be able to meet those, um, meet that bar from a GDPR perspective. We kind of need something from a cybersecurity perspective. But in a way, if we think about data as being um, the new substrate for all of this stuff, um, one of the things we talk about a lot is, is mesh and fabric. Right. If the security is built into the platform, um, at some point, you know, we get privacy and security, and I can go and I don't know, retire to Barbados or someplace where <laughs> the sun shines. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, two more people before we close the queue, and then more people in the queue later. But please be brief. Uh, I will also be around for later. So if you guys want to talk, talk to me, then it's cool. Hi, Phil Han Baker. Yeah, fascinating talk. I agree with almost all of it. <laughs> Uh, so this is the ITF, so we talk about transport security a lot, and we're really good at it. And 19 out of the 20 top breaches in every one of the past 20 years are breaches of data at rest, usually Word and PowerPoint and Excel documents. And one of the main things that we got to get around, it, the problem is not highwaymen anymore. That what the problem is is the internet creates a, a road for the attackers to get into your network. Now, so it's all about data at rest, and I've not seen anything, any new developments on that line in 20 years. If you look at how you encrypt Word documents, you encrypt them under a password, and then you email the document and the pa password, where it then sits on a mail server. And it's even worse when you look at CRM systems. The CRM systems on the market are all based on Ford Wiener key release, yeah. which is 30 years old. Yeah. NSA had that. They made Ed Snowden the manager. Yep. And so, you know, what's going to happen? You know, can we get together and get something new on data at rest? I think it's overdue. Um, I would agree with you. I think, as I said, that data, um, the security controls from a data perspective is certainly something we're focused on right now um, to try and fix. So. Yep, welcome to comment. Hi, Brian Trammell. A little bit floored to be in line behind PHP and saying that um, I agree with everything he just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's actually almost what I came up here to say, which is I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta think about how I feel about that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there was a really interesting point you made that like, we tend to think of ourselves as being in a layered box, right? You know, like down below this layer, not our problem, up above that layer, not our problem, which I think is causing us a problem in, in dealing with security threats, exactly as you said, because like 
the other side doesn't put themselves in this box, yep. right? They are incentivized to not think about the boxes at all. Indeed, it is at those box layers that there's like interesting stuff to be done. So um, that's mainly a comment to the IETF reflecting on, on uh, your talk. I did want to ask one very quick question. There's something you said really, that, that really resonated with me about like sort of the minimum viable business or the minimum size of an organization that can meaningfully participate in the internet and be secure. Do you see a way to keep that from continuing to go up over time? If we don't, we're going to lose, right? So I think it's, it's in our best interest to think about how we put these controls in place, what we're doing um, to disrupt the disruptors um, from that perspective. But again, back to the data security perspective, think about how we build those controls right in the beginning. Uh, you know, it, in, in some cases, we've been remiss, for example, in terms of not switching off uh, switching on logging or not by default switching on encryption or not by default getting rid of passwords or not by default thinking about MFA for administrators because there was a cost associated with it for the customer, right? And we, in, in my view, um, that was their decision to take. It wasn't ours to, to do that. And I think, again, today, we're very much coming from a different perspective on that. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, thinking about the, the problems that we had with Puerto Rico getting... Um, isolated during the hurricane and what Russia has been doing over the top of our undersea cables. Uh, we're now looking at space to do that same sort of uh, transmission of data. And that, in fact, I'm told that we can transmit the same amount of data under sea cables as we can over, um, over the, uh, a space. I don't know how much it would cost, don't ask me, right? And don't talk to me about licensing either, because <laughs> I don't know that. Um, but it's a, it gives us the ability to think about how we put the security in the protocols right from the get-go. It's new tech, right? So we can redesign it. Um, and, and, you know, in fairness, um, how many times have people said to me, do we just need to burn the internet down and start again from scratch? Right back at you. Do we? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, that, Thank is, you. that is a very interesting question to <laughs> finish the discussion here. Um, so we are, we are at the end of our slot, and the, clo the queue was closed. But we have actually some Microsoft person in the queue. Do you, Tommy, do you want to go to the mic or, like, have a discussion afterwards. Hang on, can I just <laughs> ask? I'm getting a question from a Microsoft co a person. Yes. Oh, okay. Tommy Jensen, Microsoft. <laughs> hey, Tommy. Good to see you outside of security training. MSRC is always fun. <laughs> so I just want to quickly answer. The, uh, I just want to quickly answer one of the questions that was posed, which is kind of quintessential here, which is what do we do with security once we hide everything on the wire, right? And we don't have to do discussion. Happy to take it offline. I just wanted to 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 point out, we do have Microsoft engineers here as well. And the answer here is we need to come to grips with the fact that all back doors are front doors and all third parties are third parties. You either need to become a networking peer or you need to think about the root scenario you're trying to solve and whether breaking into network security is the right way to do it. Become the peer or think about the larger set of the problem because end-to-end -end encryption really is better across the board. We talk about it from a human rights perspective. We talk about it from a security perspective. We talk about it from every perspective. Um, that does mean, and I say that, knowing that the endpoint then has to do more work. Get it. But I just want to be super clear about that because we do have an opinion. Thank you, Tommy. And he ticked my box. So he said peer, reminded me of peer-to-peer -peer networking for some reason. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks for listening. Yeah, please come to talk to Leslie after the session here. She will be around the rest of the day. Um, we're completely out of time, and we didn't have an open mic. And if anybody has a burning question, you can run to the mic right now. We have 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you, everybody. Mailing lists are always open. <laughs> <laughs>